Thank you, Shona. Got the clicker. And thanks to the, to the president and all of the chancellors for their commitment and making this convening possible. This is a remarkable time to be doing community-engaged scholarship, and I'm excited to share with you some of the lessons that we have learned um, in our work over uh, a quarter of a century. Um, let me begin, though, with, um, let me begin with this. Um, is there any, can we remove the little picture of me? Or maybe that has to be there. Oh, perfect, thank you. So I'm gonna start with a recruitment pitch. These squares reflect four things that I personally really enjoy doing. And what I've found is that community-engaged research really lies sort of at the intersection of these. So I really like building teams, teams of colleagues from other disciplines and teams of community partners to address um, problems, concrete problems that our community partners have identified as priorities, and to do that in a way that lets us exercise some creativity and innovation, and most importantly, to have an impact and that impact, I think, exists at at least two levels. One is a scholarly impact, where we can advance science and, um, and, and contribute new ideas and new thinking to the fields, but also the impact that we have on community, on families, on people's lives, on our neighborhoods. And I ask that if you know people, um, whether they are students that you are teaching, whether they are community members that you are working with, maybe some of you are faculty members who are kind of on the fence about you know, how deep you know, are you willing to go with community-engaged scholarship in your career. I think if you have people who like to do this sort of stuff, nudge them or give them an all-out push towards community-engaged scholarship. We need excellent people in this field. There's never been a better time in, tour, in terms of resources available. Um, it's just a, a great opportunity. Let me tell you a little bit about the, the kind of the flavor of community-engaged research that our team is involved in, just to put um, the stories that I'm going to share with you in a little broader context. So I, I lead a center called the Health Communication Research Laboratory, and our focus is really on addressing health disparities particularly in low-income and racial and ethnic minority uh, populations. And we are definitely intervention researchers. So we have this bias towards action, where we, we don't just want to understand and describe problems, but we want to come up with solutions for those and put those in place. And then I think because we've been around a while, kind of the natural evolution of our center, we have this um, strong interest in moving successful local projects into uh, you know, a kind of a broader reach nationally. And so you'll hear some examples of that today as well. Our research is organized around um, three goals. If, if health communication, which is kind of you know, what we bring to the table, if that's going to make a difference for uh, addressing health disparities, we think we have to do at least three things. We have to increase the reach of information to underserved populations who often live in information-poor environments. We have to increase the effectiveness of health information so that it's meaningful in the context of people's lives. And then third, and probably most importantly, you, you're never going to message your way out of health disparities. That would be foolish to think that. So we have to actually use information and technology to connect people to needed services, needed health services, needed social services. So all of our research is addressing at least one of those three goals. And then lastly, just um, to give you a sense of what we're drawing upon here, we've been doing this for a long time. And we've done many, many projects collaboratively with community partners, engaging many, many community members, and I'm going to pick from this six out of, I think, many more lessons learned um, over those years to share with you today. I'm going to start with this one, that health is not a primary value. And this is tough for people in this tent, perhaps, to embrace. Um, I'm trained in public health. We work with people in health care and in medicine and all sorts of allied health sciences. And I think we're often guilty of assuming that everyone in communities cares about, thinks about, 
is focused on health as much as we are. And I'm here to tell you that while that's true, sometimes, most of the time, it isn't. Most people's lives are not organized around health alone. Perhaps some of you are gardeners, or even if you're not gardeners, hopefully you have recognized or you've seen at some point burpee seeds. Have you, have you heard of burpee seeds? Okay, I've, I've got some hands up. The burpee seed company is arguably the most, it's, it's, the, it's the longest and one of the most successful mail order companies in the world. So long before we had big box home and garden stores where you could get anything you needed, people had the burpees catalog where they could order seeds and then have them delivered to their home. And, and this, uh, this young man here is named David Burpee. He's actually the son of the founder of the Burpee Seed Company, but he's the one who built it into this mega um, business that was so successful. And before he died in the 1980s, he gave an interview and was asked, what was the kind of the secret to the success of the Burpee Seed Company? And he gave an answer that became very famous and is often quoted, and you may have heard it before. He said, he said, I realized early on that customers and people don't care about my seeds. They care about their gardens. People don't care about my seeds. They care about their gardens. And we need to do a lot more. We need to reorient our thinking, I, I believe, in the health professions to focus more on people's gardens than on our seeds. Because our seeds, we're, we, really, we love our seeds. Our seeds are, we can help you reduce risk. We can help you, you know, achieve better health and increase longevity and, um, and detect you know, problems early. Those are the seeds that we have to offer people. People don't care about that as much as we think they do. What they care about are their lives and other aspects of their lives. And health is at best an instrumental value that lets them do things that they like or keeps them from doing things that they like. And so the more you can learn about what is a person's garden, what is a community's garden, the more successful we'll be with our health efforts. Let me give you just a quick illustration of this. This is from a survey uh, we did a few years back of Medicaid beneficiaries from about 10 states across the US. And this is a question that we like to ask when we're talking to people. We ask them, um, you know, what one thing, if you had to pick just one thing, what one thing would make your life better, would do the most to make your life better? And here we have the top five from this survey, taking care of your family, helping your children thrive, um, making um, improvements uh, to your job, managing your money, and then in fifth place, decimal points behind money management is health. Improving, living a healthy life would be the one thing that people say they could do to make their life better. Now, what this means is, if you approached this sample that we engaged and your focus was health, nine out of 10 times, you'd be missing the boat. That would not be what people were most concerned about. That's a pretty high miss rate. And so the more we can do to understand what it is that people care about and framing what we have to offer in, t in those terms, or even putting our stuff in the back seat for a minute and trying to help people with the things that they care about, the more successful we're going to be. Here's a quick follow-up to that. Of those who, um, who, who said the most important thing to me is living a healthy life, we dug a little bit deeper. We actually stratified these responses by how much stress they were feeling in their lives right now. And so what you can see here is that um, among people who didn't have very much stress in their lives, they were actually more likely to say health is the most important thing. But the more stress people are feeling, the less important health became for them. So people who reported having a high level of stress in their life, one out of 20 people said, oh, Improving my health is the most important thing. And that leads us to lesson number two, that in the lives of many underserved um, individuals and communities, health is just one of many, many needs that they have. In short, if your refrigerator looks like this, if you have unstable housing situation, if you have to walk past scenes like this in your daily life, 
If you're afraid day to day that someone close to you might hurt you, if you're sending your kids to school and you're not feeling good about the safety, uh, about their safety when they're in the schools, if you're not sure how you're going to pay for essentials like food on a day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week basis, if your transportation is, is unreliable, how important is it going to be for you, really, to get a mammogram or to get vaccinated or so many of the things that we want people to do to have healthier individuals and families and communities? And, and I think everyone knows the answer to that. It's not going to be as important. And frankly, I could argue that it shouldn't be as important, that these are more pressing um, acute needs that people have. And what we now know from a really rapidly growing and developing science of social needs, and these needs that I just illustrated, we, we, we now think of these as social needs. We used to call them basic needs. Um, but these social needs are associated with a raft of adverse health outcomes adverse mental health outcomes, adverse physical health outcomes, um, uh, more utilization of health care, less um, uh, you know, um, uh, adherence to medication regimens, and ultimately um, less, uh, uh, more, more mortality, less longevity. There's a whole science that is, if you're working in this space, this is so important right now. This is one of the things that our team is working on. We don't really fully understand the mechanisms through which all of these life stressors and um, sort of economic strain impact health outcomes, but we, we're getting some good ideas. So we think in general that this raises people's level of worry and stress, which increases things like anxiety and depression. It interferes with sleep and ultimately, it affects people's cognitive bandwidth and their ability to pay attention to and act on anything that isn't those uh, acute needs. We know even less, although a lot of people are working on this, about what works to address these social needs. The idea is, and I think there's some evidence here, that if you address these social needs, that it, it, it increases the opportunity for health to improve. So linkage interventions are like screening and referral interventions. I'm going to find out what you need and connect you to community agencies that do that. Social needs navigators are sort of like case managers that, that can help you access those resources. And then higher level solutions, community level structural solutions that might provide affordable housing and things like this. We're still in the early stages of figuring out what works, and there's a whole science that has to develop here that is just begging for um, input. How do we know, how do we know uh, what this looks like in a COVID context, just to make the, uh, uh, make the social needs um, you know, sort of uh, uh, idea contemporary? What I'm showing you here, these are calls to 211. Are you familiar with 211? It's a three-digit um, helpline. This is where people call if they can't pay their rent or their utility bills or they need food to feed their families. And, I'm showing you the first 10 months of uh, 2020 here. These are calls across the country every single day. The red bar represents the first day of the global COVID-19 pandemic. And the pattern here is unmistakable. So what the, what the pandemic has brought is a dramatic increase in, in um, these social needs and literal calls for help that has not yet returned to pre-COVID levels. And I'll tell you, um, because you know, we collect these data, more about that in a minute, I'll tell you that just in the last month, the changes from April to May, 11% increase nationally in calls to 211. This is almost certainly because of um, rising prices that are affecting um, the most vulnerable in our communities. We know this because this is one of our community-engaged success stories. Working with 211s, first locally and then um, around the country, um, we actually have data every single day about every social need that gets requested to 211. And it's all available in this uh, public set of dashboards that we call 211 counts. And it's, it's, we're in almost every state now, including New Jersey. And so if you were to click on New Jersey, you would land on this dashboard for New Jersey. If you haven't looked at this, I hope you will. Um, New Jersey gets over half a million requests a year to 211 for these social needs. And you could go on here right now and you could see what people called about yesterday. 
in a hundred different categories and subcategories um, and at the zip code level. So where are those needs coming from? So this is just one example. This is, by the way, I think this is the closest we have in the US to a daily surveillance system for social needs. Um, and this is an example, I think, of the third lesson that I want to share with you, which is the importance of building community listening infrastructure. If you're going to do community-engaged research, you sure have to know what's happening in the community and what people's needs are and what their priorities are. And I think historically, my field at least, I mean, we'll do things like we'll convene focus groups or we'll talk to a few people, and that's, that's good. It's good, but it's not great. It's the 21st century, and we have all sorts of ways of interacting with people and engaging with them. And so I want to challenge everybody here to you know, think beyond, you know, I don't want us to get lazy about how we listen to community. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of, of what we're doing in St. Louis. Um, and this has been pretty revolutionary for us. So we've set up panels of, of, of individuals and engage them on, in some cases, um, multi-times a week for long periods of time to try to understand what's happening in their lives. Here's one example. This is, uh, we call this our Life During COVID project. We um, identified 60 low-income women in St. Louis, all of whom had children, school-aged children, who were in school. And every three days for the last 17 months, we send them a text message that has a link to a survey, a short survey, two or three minutes um, on that survey. And we ask them, as you can see sort of with the picture on the right, we ask them simple questions like this. How much, is a prob how much um, of a problem is this for you right now, not having enough money to pay your electric, gas, or water bill? And they just move a slider from zero to 100. Zero, it's not a problem at all. 100, it's a huge problem for me right now. And so we ask questions about their social needs, their health, their jobs, how are their kids doing um, in school, and what sorts of COVID-related impacts um, are they experiencing. So far, we've had, from those 60 uh, women, we've had over 6,000 completed uh, little mini-surveys at an 80% response rate. This is astonishing for, you know, given you know, our experience. And we have um, almost every one of these households has at least 100 observations um, over more than a year's time. Let me give you just a really simple taste of what this tells us. So each of these little postage stamp um, line charts that you see is a person and one outcome. And so this, I just picked transportation. These are transportation needs that they reported. And what you need to know here is that the y-axis, the vertical axis for each of these line charts, is um, how big a problem it is. The closer to the top that line is, that's a big problem. The closer to the bottom, that's a smaller problem for them. So let me show you some specific examples. So each of these charts, again, is one person. So this is one person over the period of maybe eight or nine months. And you can see that this person, they're Transportation needs go up and down, but not that much. But over time, the pattern here is really clear. This person's transportation needs are becoming more, they're increasing over time. Bigger transportation needs. Here's another person. What you see with this person is a lot of transportation needs early on over the first three months or so, and then, boom, transportation needs disappear. What do you think happened here? Person, person maybe got a car. Maybe somebody, maybe they moved in with somebody who had a car. There was a solution here that worked really well for this person. Here is the opposite pattern. This person has no transportation needs at all for months, and then something happens, something dramatic and transformational, and now they have constant transportation problems. It's a huge problem for them. What happens here? Maybe this person's car broke down. Maybe they couldn't make the payments on this car any longer. Okay, but this changes. And then here's yet another one. Look at this episodic pattern. This person has no transportation needs except for about every month or two. And then they have a big transportation need. This might be a homebound person who has to get to health care. This might be somebody who has an out-of-town relative that they need to see and they have no way of getting there. The point is 
that each of these patterns represents a very different sort of transportation problem, and it suggests that the way we screen for social needs, the kinds of interventions that we develop for social needs, or like transportation, or even how we think about the way a social need might impact health, is widely different for different folks. Does that make sense? And so this puts us a whole lot closer, I think, to a, kind of a, a more sophisticated science of social needs. And you get this by listening carefully. Here's another example. And, and, and the idea of listening is right here in the name. This is a, a project, a COVID project, that we call I Heard. And it has started in St. Louis, but it's about to, it's about to spread to multiple other states and we're really excited about. Um, as the vaccines became available, what we were hearing from our community partners is people are, get, people are telling us the wildest stories, misinformation about things they've heard about the vaccine, and our frontline staff don't even know how to respond to that. They know that it's outlandish, but they don't really have the, they don't have the counter messages to, to explain to people why this is not something they should be paying attention to. And so together with these community partners, we created a system where we would identify what's happening in the community in terms of um, COVID misinformation and then share with them um, responses that their teams could use. So there are three goals in this project. First, we want to identify what misinformation is new in our community and how it's spreading, what's spreading the fastest. We want to share that information with our community partners, and then we want to distribute to those community partners responses that they can use. Once again, we are doing, uh, we're texting, we, we created a panel of over 200 community members, about half of them frontline workers, and every week on Sunday afternoon, we send them a text message. It has a link to a two-minute survey um, that they can complete on their mobile phone, and um, and they've got two days to respond to that survey. We've been doing this since last August, so 42 consecutive weeks of misinformation surveillance. This is the, this is the first local COVID misinformation surveillance system in the U.S. And we ask them simple questions like this. In the last seven days, have you heard? And then we'll give them a myth to respond to. If they've heard it, we ask, where did they hear about it? And what was their reaction? So did they think it was... Did it seem like it was true? Did it seem like it was not true? And then we ask an open-ended question. What else are you hearing about COVID? By the way, we also ask a question that has nothing to do with COVID, which is, what are you most concerned about in the community? And we give those to the mayor's office every week. Um, if you're wondering how we do this, it's, it's pretty interesting, and um, it's been very successful for us. Um, we've had in this project a 90% response rate um, over uh, 42 weeks of weekly surveys. What we do when someone joins our panel is we, we issue them one of these electronic cash cards, and each time they complete a survey, we put a little, uh, a little um, reimbursement onto their card, so it happens uh, almost instantly as they respond. Just to give you a sense of what this shows us, um, here we're just looking at how people have been exposed to different misinformation items and how fast that declines over time. So on the far left here, this is back in the fall, the idea that ivermectin can prevent or cure COVID. That stuck around in St. Louis for about 13 weeks, um, but it dropped pretty fast. It dropped from a high of 82% of people saying, yeah, I've heard that, down to only 7% of people hearing that over about a three-month period. In the middle, though, the, the natural immunity idea that, hey, I've had COVID, so I don't need the, the vaccine, that will protect me, that stuck around a lot longer and it was much slower to, um, to decline. So we had 23 weeks of that misinformation and it declined less than ivermectin. And then the idea that boosters aren't needed because the vaccines, uh, vac boosters are only needed because the vaccines don't work, that didn't move much at all. It was never as prominent a misinformation, but it, it, it was fairly persistent. And so what we do with this information, and this is from back in January, but we're able to look at 
what's the rate of exposure to misinformation, how much do people in the community believe that misinformation, and is it trending up or down, and we can set priorities and then convey these priorities back to the community partners. Look, right now, it's the red stuff that you need to pay attention to. The orange stuff is also pretty important. The green stuff we can probably ignore. And we, and, and we then create these weekly um, alerts that tell our community partners how me, or what are the priority misinformation items to address each week. And you can see that you know, they don't, the community organizations don't all read every one of these, but about a third of them do. And about 10% click on the link, which takes them to our dashboard. So this dashboard is updated each week with the surveillance results. And in the lower left corner, you won't be able to see this, but this is the most important part. This is the response component. So if you hear this misinformation, then you should say this. And here are the sources that are behind that. So all of this going back to community partners telling us we can't deal with misinformation, and so together we built a system that found it and gave them responses. Community partners are good for, you know, you know they make virtually everything we do better. One of the really important ways that I think they can advance this work is by expanding reach because they have access to um, many populations that might be of interest for this work. So I'm going to share with you, this is actually not our work, but this is one of my favorite global health stories. Um, unfortunately, diarrheal diseases are still a major health threat to, um, to children, um, particularly in certain parts of the world, um, and especially in remote areas of those um, developing countries. Um, this is all the more frustrating because there's a really simple, incredibly inexpensive, um, and highly effective solution to prevent um, deaths from diarrheal diseases. Just oral rehydration therapy, mixing um, water and sugar and salt together. The challenge has been, how do we get this, how do we get uh, oral rehydration therapy to some of the most remote areas um, of the world? And what the what the, public health leaders, what the public health leaders working on this problem recognized is, you know, boy, we don't seem to be able to do it, but other people do. And so here's, here's Coca-Cola um, being distributed in one of these places where diarrheal diseases remains a major threat. And this is no accident. So if you know Coca-Cola, they're, they're basically their company, I don't know if it's a motto or a, a, a mission, is that you should always be within an arms, a Coca-Cola should always be within an arm's reach of desire. In other words, when you want a Coke, it should be easily accessible to you. And so their success is, is largely based upon their distribution network, where Coca-Colas go from bottlers to trucks to hand carts, and ultimately that, that um, uh, ubiquitous Coca-Cola um, uh, bottle carrier can even be hand carried to remote locations. I want you to think about that Coca-Cola bottle carrier and looking at it from the top, looking at the tops of those 16-ounce bottles in that case, all right? So here's what the, here's what the um, public health folks realized. There's some space there. And they redesigned their oral rehydration packets into these triangle wedge-shaped packages that could fit in between, in the interstitial spaces between bottles of Coca-Cola. And here's another example of that sort of packaging design. And they could, in essence, hitchhike on the existing distribution infrastructure of Coca-Cola to get this life-saving treatment, oral rehydration therapy, anywhere that Coca-Cola goes. If you're interested in this story, go to colalife.org and you can read more about it and the evaluations. But I introduce this because our team is not above stealing great ideas from other people. And we did this during COVID. So as you know, during COVID, the disease had a disproportionate impact, at, at, at least early on, on, um, on older adults, and particularly older adults who were health compromised. Um, we had community partners 
at the St. Louis Area Agency on Aging who were especially concerned about a subgroup of sick older adults, and that was the homebound sick older adults, because they couldn't get out, easily at least, in order to get vaccinated. And so our Coca-Cola was home delivered meal programs, like Meals on Wheels. So the way those programs work, they package up meals, they box up a week's worth of meals in these boxes that you see on the right, and then volunteers or staff members from senior centers deliver those um, boxes of, uh, of prepared meals um, into people's homes who are in those programs. And in St. Louis, there are thousands of older adults who receive these, um, uh, these, these meals, and we thought that's an opportunity. That's our Coca-Cola. So you can't really see it, but on top of this box that's being delivered here is one of our flyers, which says, we're going to be calling you, and we want to hear about how your meals are going. We also want to talk to you about COVID. And if you haven't been um, vaccinated already or you haven't had a booster, let us know because we will bring it to you. And we worked with the fire department and the health department to actually bring vaccinations to people's homes when they hadn't had them and when they, and when they wanted them. That worked so well vaccinating hundreds of homebound seniors, that when COVID tests became available, in-home COVID tests, we were pretty excited about that possibility. All you had to do to get your COVID test was to go online and order it. So you just had to have internet and a computer and computer skills. Guess what? Our population didn't. So we did a very quick and dirty assessment of 11 of these homebound seniors. None of them had ever taken an in-home COVID test. Um, less than half of them um, knew that you could get free in-home COVID tests. When we explained how you could order them, two of the 11 said, yes, I would be able to do this, but the others said, no, I couldn't do that. Um, but eight of them said, if, if, I, if there was help to order it, I would do it. So here's another opportunity. We jumped on it. We got the city to give us a, a ton of COVID tests. We mobilized, this is classic old community engagement stuff, but this is, uh, this is my family and some staff members stuffing COVID tests um, into these little Ziploc bags with an instruction booklet and a mask. And then we delivered these to every senior center that does home delivered meals in the city of St. Louis. And right now, every time those packages go out, every household is getting one of those COVID tests, instruction booklets um, with them. Now, we weren't sure, because this was kind of a labor-intensive um, approach, we weren't sure if that was the best way to do it or if there was a better alternative. So in five surrounding counties outside of St. Louis, we tried this other option. Also through home-delivered meals, we gave this little order card. All they had to do was check, yes, um, I would like help getting my COVID kits, and then give it back to them the following week when their meals came. And then uh, we would have a team that would go ahead and process the order for them so their test kits would be sent to them. So we're doing a little comparison of which of these methods is most effective to solve this community problem. Two final um, quick uh, lessons here. The first has to do with the importance of um, local trusted messengers, and I think Shauna referred to some of this work in her introduction. For a long time, we spent 10 or 15 years just um, uh, working on and studying the effects of stories, lived experiences, people's personal narratives, and they're really important. And part of what makes them important is the messengers are trusted local people with authentic voices. And so um, we, we wanted to um, sort of apply some of that thinking to COVID, and this is all pretty recent. So by the, by the end of 2021 in St. Louis, most of the unvaccinated people were not vaccine hesitant, they were vaccine resistant. They had made a choice at that point that they didn't want to get vaccinated. And so our, our partners in the city and county health department, they said, look, we need to change approaches here. We don't, we, we don't need any more health department people trying to persuade people to get vaccinated. What we need is we need more conversations in the community about vaccinations among family members and among friends. How can we do that? How can we help foster that sort of discussion? And so together we came up with an, with an idea, and the goal was to increase these conversations about uh, COVID vaccination between uh, people who had just been vaccinated and their unvaccinated friends and family members. 
So we created this multi-component communication intervention. It had these three pieces that I'll sort of describe here. So the first were these vaccine card holders, and they are exactly what it sounds like. It's everyone gets the vaccine card, and when you get vaccinated or boosted, they update the information. But now, if you're in St. Louis City or County, and, and you are getting vaccinated, your card gets inserted into one of these card holders that you can keep. And you can see on the right the card in there. You'll also see um, tucked into that little pocket is that purple, well, I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. So here's, here's how it works. Someone gets vaccinated, they get, um, they get their vaccine card in the little card holder. But also inside that card holder are these little business card size pieces that we call conversation cards. The conversation cards are meant to um, give people short cues that they can act upon, something they could say to start a conversation, or something they could give to someone just to help them think about it. So this one says, vaccinated or not, you mean a lot to me, but I worry you'll get COVID. Um, have concerns, have questions, you know, you can, you can scan this QR code. We developed um, through a process of, uh, you know, a lot of formative testing, four of these cards, and then we evaluate them. So we have a little touch screen exit interview device that we take periodically to these vaccine events. And so we've asked people, what do you think of the vaccine card holder? And you can see that virtually everybody either really likes them or kind of likes them. So, so that's encouraging. Using this same technology, we ask them which of the cards they like the most, so we get some feedback there. And, and they, like, they like the cards pretty equally, except the one um, which is, you know, I'm worried my mom will, would get COVID. I think maybe it just was um, too limited an audience. But they generally liked the cards. Um, and then we ask, do you think you'll give a card to an unvaccinated friend or family member? And over half said, yes, I will. Um, and another quarter were kind of on the fence. Maybe they would. And then um, we also asked for those who said, yes, I'm going to give the card to somebody. We said, do you have someone in mind? Is there someone specific that you think you might give a card to? And about two-thirds said, yes, I do have someone in mind to give this to. Now, we did a follow-up. We're actually still doing this, so this, these are very much in-process data. But we got a group of people to um, let us contact them two weeks later. And what we found is that 63% said, um, that they had given one of those conversation cards to a family member or friend, and half of them said that it helped them to talk to others. So again, starting with a community need, how do we get more conversations in the community about vaccination among people who've been vaccinated? And um, here's a simple little approach that seems to be working. Final lesson learned. This is included um, uh, at Shauna's request because I know this is one of her, uh, her favorites. The idea of co-creation. So 23 years ago, Nike launched a new service that allowed its customers to create their own Nike shoes. And so it was initially called Nike ID, and you, you could customize your shoes in over 30 different ways. You could choose the fabric, you could choose the colors, you could choose the color of the laces, almost everything about the shoe you could customize. And you pay a little premium for that, but you get exactly what you want, and it's personalized. This became, you know, this sort of started the coining of the phrase co-creation. And a lot has been written and studied about co-creation after sort of the Nike success. Um, and just to summarize that science, when people are involved in co-creating, when a customer is involved in co-creating, they feel a stronger connection to the product that they have at the end. They feel more engaged and dedicated and satisfied with the product that has um, uh, been created. And they're more likely to tell other people about it in a positive way. That's co-creation. Think about the solutions that we come up with working together with community members and community organizations and community partners. This is what we want. This is why you involve and engage community members, because they will then feel these sorts of connections and dedication to what emerges, uh, what you've created collectively. Our first true co-creation test, if you will, started um, about 15 years ago. We actually went into a middle school, Gateway Middle School in inner city St. Louis, and 
um, they were interested in sort of opening their students' eyes to different career possibilities for them. And since we were health, we said, well, let's talk about health careers. All the kids knew about doctors and nurses. None of them knew about many of the other, you know, sort of health-related disciplines. We went into the language arts program. This is like, you know, English and languages. Um, and we worked with the students and the teachers to create these magazines called Pathways that the students created, the students authored, the students interviewed other African-American professionals in St. Louis who had these different jobs. And then these were distributed school-wide and they read them in classes. We evaluated this and found that, um, um, you know, very, we were very excited to find that the students were much more aware of um, about a half dozen different health um, professions that they didn't know about before, and they were much more interested in those. And stepping further back the pipeline in middle school where they can still make decisions at the high school level about courses. So um, I'm a, an absolute true believer in co-creation. I hope you guys are doing this in, in your own work. So those are the six lessons that I talked about. I actually have no idea how much time or how little time I have left, but if there's any time left, I'd be happy to um, take questions that you may have. And I just want to say that I get to talk about this stuff, but we have an amazing team that over the years numbers way over 500 um, you know, students and faculty members and staff, not to mention community partners who get all the credit for this work. Thank you. So the question is, um, how have we been able to sustain this from a funding standpoint? Um, we, you know, we write a lot of grants. I, I guess that's the, um, that's the shortest answer. But I, I made the point earlier, and I really want to emphasize this. I think that many of the funding agencies um, that have traditionally supported health research, if they didn't already know the value of this type of work, they're seeing it now. And so we see more and more opportunities to do this um, with funding from lots of different sort of pathways. Um, a lot of the COVID examples that I shared were um, funded through federal COVID community partnership initiatives. I know some folks here are involved in some of those partnerships as well. Um, but I would also say that like some of these, like the dashboard, the social needs dashboard that we created, that actually has become, that's a really great sustainability success story because that now supports itself. There's no external funding um, to do that work. Um, I think, I'll just tell you what, I, what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that what comes out of the COVID experience is that there's a realization that the capacity of many local organizations, great as it is, can't do all of this sort of of, of work without some partnership, and that there's some capacity that academic institutions have that community organizations don't have, and that together there are opportunities to do way, way more, far better things than we have been doing, and that new streams may become available to support exactly that sort of work. And so we're, you know, we've been advocating for that, and I think some of the funders are listening, but that's. Um, that's probably the, the main answer. Thank you. Yes? Thanks so much for, for the presentation. One question I think we're all struggling with people who do this work is, in terms of sustainability, is that it takes time to build this relationship, and oftentimes with community organization, there's a huge amount of transition. And so you spend a lot of time working with folks and developing this relationship and then things happen and, and folks move away. And, and, and so my question is, have you find some sort of a way of uh, overcoming this problem of attrition or, or, or uh, change that can build more institutionalized way of working closely with communities to do this? Um, so how do you, you know, how do you make how do you form partnerships that are um, robust to changes in individual personnel? It's a, it's a really important question. 
I guess I think um, in some ways, I, I don't know how representative our case is, but you know, I've been doing this in one community for 30 years, and so you know a lot of people and you build a lot of relationships, and, and in the best case scenario, when a, you know, when a key contact leaves, there's a handoff to the, to the next person. And there's enough social capital built and established that, um, you know, that there is that trust and reciprocity. But I think you can't just assume that that is going to be the case. And when there are transitions, you need to, you know, sort of start over. Honestly, I think all of this boils down to um, relationships. And you're right that those relationships are often between people, but, you know, people will speak on behalf of you based upon what they've experienced with you, right? And so I think that that's super important. I would just say, especially to the young people um, who are contemplating a career in this pathway, I, I would say, I think about this all the time, like there are, there are two calls or two emails that, that if you get these, it is immediately, it's above the top of your list. It's the most important thing. If a community partner calls you um, or if a participant in one of your projects contacts you, nothing is more important than those two things. You drop everything and you, and you see through to you know, the most satisfactory response, um, whatever it is that those folks need. Um, even above, for me, I, hopefully this isn't, being, maybe it's being recorded, like that's above like if your dean contacts you and, <laughs> and asks you to do something, it's the most important thing. And if you, if you enter into these community partnerships and relationships with that sort of a perspective, I think that's a really good start. And the other, you know, kind of, if, if that's lesson 1A, one, you know, maybe 1B would be, you need to be comfortable doing a lot of things that don't benefit you directly. Like if, if a community partner wants to do this and, and, you know, that doesn't really fit with where you're going, y you have to find a way to be helpful. You can't just say, eh, eh not really that interested. Um, and so I think it's a, it is a different mindset. It's a set of priorities that you have to really um, embrace and live. Yes. So uh, I'm referring to your work about people who can't pay their electricity bill, etc., or can't make a car payment. So this must be emotionally very draining to, to see the disaster stories. That's one question, how do you deal with that? And the other one is, have people directly approached you and said, can you help me pay my car bill or, or my electricity bill? And how are you dealing with this? Because in the end, a lot of problems in life can be solved if there's just enough money, except there is never enough money, right? Yeah, so, um, so good question. Um, I'll, let me address, there's several questions baked in there. Let me start with the first one, which is like, what's it like to where your work every day is hearing how difficult the lives of others are? Um, it's hard, I, 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 no question about it. And I think being a health disparities researcher, it, it's, I can't not see the world through that lens. And you see inequity everywhere. And, it's, and it is really hard. And I don't know, I've not found a way to ever detach from that. So I think that's another part of this that you have to sort of understand comes with the territory. So that's, that's my answer there. In terms of specific requests, like you know, people can't pay their utility bills, I think that you know, we have to understand what our role is there. I mean, our role is not, you know, as individuals and as a team, is not, is not to provide you know, rescue from that immediate resource, that's not really what we do. What we can do is link people to the agencies and organizations that do deal with that. And mo more importantly, I think as a university, we can generate evidence-based solutions that do a better job of dealing with that. That may not help you as an individual trying to pay your utility bill or stop disconnection today, but in the long term, it can. So let me just give you like two concrete examples of that. One, if, here's what we know. We know that certain social needs tend to cluster, right? And so if you have someone who is, they can't 
They're having tr problems with transportation, let's say, and they're having problems with food. They can't handle both of those. We may not need to solve both of those problems. We might be able to, if we can solve one of those problems, that gives them enough flexibility that they can solve or help solve the other problem. But that's not how we do it right now. We say, OK, you have three problems. Let's find, give you three solutions. That's not a very smart or efficient way to do it. So as evidence builds, we'll have better solutions there. The, the other uh, key thing is policy advocacy, where we have evidence that can, that can support policies. We've shown in, during COVID that when communities enact um, uh, you know, sort of um, w when they suspend uh, disconnection you know, for unpaid utility bills, that has really beneficial and immediate measurable effects on the people who are affected. Now, that's not necessarily going to be a permanent solution, but it might say, hey, are there ways that we can make certain um, houses more energy efficient so that those utility bills come down in price so that there isn't as much default? So there are other ways that we can contribute. Good questions. Thank you. In the back. Hi. Um, my name's Althea Pestine Stevens. I work at the School of Social Work. And um, I wanted to acknowledge that this is a very interdisciplinary group today. And I really appreciate, thank you so much for all of your insights on this, on, on this work. And I've noticed, especially as public health has been in the forefront of public, really, uh, for the past couple of years, some really strong leadership from so, like the American Public Health Association, professional organizations, academic organizations about the importance of messaging and engagement and not just generating knowledge but making sure that it's knowledge that's going how it how is it communicated to people and how does it involve people and things like that and also a lot of these findings you know coming from a social work perspective maybe seem a little bit intuitive even if they're not necessarily put into practice as much as we'd like to see them i was wondering if you had any advice for folks who might be in other disciplines who might not yet have so, these types of values uh, championed by their leadership or as pervasive? So um, I, I'm actually in a school of social work. Our, our public health program is in the school of social work at least for another year. So they just announced we're, we're starting a new school of public health. I'm breaking news here. Washington University is going to start its first new school in over 100 years, um, a school of public health. So we're excited about that. I, I, I guess, um, yes, there are, there are certainly disciplines that more naturally come to this kind of work. But I would say that for me, the most interesting and exciting collaborations with academic partners are with those who um, are not necessarily drawn to this sort of work. And, and the example I would give is um, we work a lot with our School of Art and Architecture, and particularly with people who work in information design. I have learned more personally. My work is so much better once I understood how information designers, for example, see the world and what they understand about how people process information. Our, all of our products that we develop with community members are better. Our insights gained from um, community members are better. Our grant proposals are better. So I would actually, um, I would encourage you to have as many conversations with people in, you know, far-fetched sort of, not far-fetched, but, you know, far-ranging disciplines um, who, who don't do this and think this way, because you're probably going to learn more from them. Um, so my question was, um, Considering that the populations and community, the communities that you reach out to are more likely to disregard health um, outreach interventions because they have more immediate and pressing needs, what would you say are the most important factors to consider when you're creating these outreach methods and interventions to make them more appealing and like make, them, make people more um, likely to give it a chance, even if it's not their most pressing need? Yeah, great question. I think there are, there are two things that we've done, and um, I think they've both been pretty successful. One of them I'm going to, uh, one of them I will um, kind of crudely refer to as framing. So instead of 
talking about health for health's sake, we place health in the context of things that matter in people's lives. And so um, one, of, you know, one of the studies that we did years ago that I think was most revolutionary was we actually um, we compared different approaches of talking about breast cancer screening and healthy eating. And we did this based upon understanding from individuals what they valued most. And so we looked at things, we looked at values like faith and family and uh, identity and also kind of time orientation. Are they more oriented towards the present or the future? And we could talk about, for example, breast cancer screening in the context of those values. So if someone, if, if faith and spirituality was really important to someone, we could actually convey to them that the Lord has given us a powerful tool to find breast cancer early when it can still be treated effectively. So getting a mammogram together with the power of prayer gives you the best chance to live a long and healthy life in the service of God. Now, some people might hear that and say, what the, what, what's that all about? But we were betting that if, if people are really oriented towards um, faith and spirituality, that instead this makes a connection. This makes a connection to something that they care about. And what we found was, in fact, that was true, that when we put these health messages in the context of people's values, that, they, that more of those people actually got screened. So that's, that's the framing approach. The other approach, um, I don't have a good name for it, but it's basically sort of postponing health, right? Which is to say that if someone is most concerned about, you know, how do I make sure that my kids are getting through this school closure okay, and we're interested in some health outcome, is set aside the health outcome and see if you can come up with something that helps them with what they care about. And you're sort of relationship building and trust building so that at some point in the future, you can say, listen, you know, maybe you should also think about you know, vaccinating your child now that we have one of these, um, now that we have a, an approved vaccine. So I think those are, those are two approaches. One is make it meaningful to people based on what they care about, and another is to actually invest time and resources to improve their lives in ways that they define. Thank you all very much.